In this episode, I will explore the elusive, the confusing, the mystifying mystery known as the half-halt, the dressage student's white whale. Many other teachers have gone before me, claiming to be able to simplify it, to demystify it, and to clarify it, but they end up just complicating it. I'm usually pretty good at explaining things, so is this episode going to clarify or confuse or complicate the half-halt even more? I guess you're going to have to listen to find out. So here we go, episode 112, Complicating the Half-Halt. Hi, I'm Karen Rolfe, and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony. Because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. If you've watched or participated in a dressage lesson, a more traditional dressage lesson, chances are you have heard this term screamed across an arena, half halt, half halt, half halt. <laughs> and there's a good chance that you, something happened and you never really saw what the result was. You never really were sure what just happened. Whether you were watching it, you couldn't see it. Maybe you were doing something. You just put a bunch of aids on. And uh, I think the more people have um, been confused by half halts and and had um, the experience of not understanding what it's supposed to do and not understanding if they did it, um, then people who do feel successful at it. Now, it is a valuable thing. There is a way to artfully ride it, and it's important. The concept is hugely important. But as we'll see in this episode, um, hopefully I'll get you to think about it a little bit differently. You'll understand why the heck it exists in the first place. And you'll have a, a different sort of bigger picture, more holistic view of it. I'd like to quote my mom at the beginning of this podcast, who sat arena side while I uh, took many, many lessons. And at one point she's like, I must have watched thousands of, of lessons and I still don't know what a half hold is. I still don't see anything happening. <laughs> so that's why I'm here. And when I want to talk about something like this that so many students have trouble with, I like to search for it. Like I'll, I'll do a little Google search. What is a half halt? Because I want to see what what students are finding out there when they try to understand it more. And so when I look, uh, and, you know, I type in what is a half halt, I'll come across lots of articles with titles such as the half halt demystified or clarifying the half halt or the half halt simplified, things like that. And the articles often start out with a list of aids and then they go on for a bunch of pages <laughs> and it starts to get a little complicated. And there's, um, well, let me just give you the aids for it because often this is where the articles start. So to perform the half halt, one must do some version of closing your leg, some version of straightening up and tightening your back and closing your hands for a moment. And then at the end of the half halt, you lighten your hands. And so it's, it's some version of that. So close your leg, tighten your back and close your hands. And you can maybe start to see an inherent problem there because all of those things are often things that we're trying to do less of. <laughs> we're trying to not be always pushing with our legs and we're trying to be more supple in our bodies and we're trying to not have a, a fist-like grip on the reins. So in my teaching, you'll notice that I, I don't teach in an aid dominant way. Of course, we're using aids, but that's not where my description starts. 
Because I think when people hear a list of aids and just apply it without the intention behind it and without any um, feel or purpose behind it, it's just putting aids on a body. And the horses need to know the intention. So the student needs to know the intention to start with. So the other problem with just applying aids, and especially in a half halt where a lot of the times it's described as a right rein half halt or a left rein half halt, or sometimes it's a both rein half halt, is, you know, we're so hand dominant anyway. And, and you can easily see like, wait a minute, I'm closing my leg, I'm tightening my back, and I'm closing my hand all at once. That kind of feels like a recipe for disaster. And it kind of feels like what's happening when students are having a lot of problems. You know, a lot of problems I see in people trying to learn dressage is that they're clamping with their legs, they're tight with their back, and they're hanging on their hands. <laughs> so why would we want to increase those aids in an important moment? It just seems like it's co compounding whatever problems might be happening to begin with. It's like not speaking a you know, foreign language and you start shouting. So I think the the next place we have to go beyond what, what are the aids for it, we have to think about um, what's supposed to happen from those aids, right? So if we think about what is actually supposed to happen, it's about the horse becoming more active and energized in their hind end. It's about the weight shifting up and back. So you want the horse to feel taller for a moment and shifting the weight over the hind legs or the hind legs carry more weight because they just stepped under, right? Those two things kind of go together. And there's a bit of compression involved because you're closing your hands for that moment. So a lot of the descriptions will sound like, you know, you make sure your horse is active off your leg and then you activate with your leg, but then close your hands like a fist on the reins and they'll even use, the descriptions will even use words like um, drive them into the closed hands or, you know, brace your hand or block the energy forward and things like that, that I just, I don't think are helpful. <laughs> um, so, but the, the compression part is true. Okay. So there's some compression going on here, right? It's activating while thinking more uphill, while compressing for a moment and then at the height of this um, compression, the horse is rebalanced. That's the key word. And so then you can give your hands again because they have this newfound balance and lightness. It's kind of like close your leg, hold with your back, close your hands, and then a miracle happens. And then you can let your hands go. <laughs> and so it's that, it's that part where the miracle is supposed to happen that we run into trouble. And like I said, I think half of the trouble is the way it's described to, to get there. You can't just close your leg, tighten your back and close your hand all at once on a horse that typically won't cause things to improve until you are doing it artfully in a particular situation. So we'll get to that. Um, the, the other thing about, uh, just even if you know the intention of all those aids, okay, my horse is supposed to get more active. They're supposed to shift their weight up and back and they're supposed to compress for a moment. And then I should be able to be light at the end of it. Okay. That's what's going to happen when I add all these aids. It's, it's not necessarily true for all horses. It's, it gets truer and truer as you advance, but I'm, I'm picturing the students who are at the lower levels of dressage are just trying to figure it out. And that word half halt is screamed at lots of beginner dressage people. And, and they're being asked to do a half halt from a place where it won't work. So, you know, picture, picture a horse who's, um, really dropped in their back and tight and contracting in their neck and, um, hyper energetic. You know, so think like freaked out Arab, <laughs> nothing against Arabs, but you know, high headed, dropped in the back, super active behind. And now picture that that horse 
has leg applied and the rider stiffens their back and blocks them with their hand. Chances are there's going to be more energy, but the back's going to get more hollow and the neck's going to get shorter. And I don't think that's necessarily helping anything. Some horses already are pretty balanced. You know, they might be um, carrying themselves pretty well. They might just be a little low in the neck, but all you have to do is energize them. You don't really have to think about anything else. Like maybe you just energize them, but you want to keep your back the same and you want to just be there with your hands. Don't tighten the neck and they just need a little boost of energy and then everything will change. All right. So there's these different situations. There might be a, a horse that you actually want to think about being elastic in your arms in the moment that you do something with your leg, or maybe he's got a lot of power and he has a really flexible neck that tends to be short. And all he needs to do is have you sit up with your body. And, and if you just sit up with your body, those hind legs are supplying all the energy you need. And at the same time, you need to be able to have him reach his neck like two inches longer. And so you don't want to be thinking about just closing your fist just because that was written as one of the aids for the half haul. So when I'm thinking of particularly people trying to achieve, you know, nice working gates, half halts are often not what you need. They're the opposite of what you need. So, okay, and we'll get into that a little bit more. So now we think, okay, we've heard the aids. We've heard what's supposed to happen with the aids. But then you can think, well, why? <laughs> why do I want why do I want to do that? And this is where I think it's really important. This is the good stuff. Like, why am I doing it? The purpose of a half halt is to rebalance the horse. Great. That sounds good. Rebalancing and achieving a better balance sounds like a pretty good thing. So when is it used? Half halts are are best used in a couple circumstances. One, if everything's going well, like you've got a nice working gait or you've got a nice collected gait, whatever it is, you're going along in your nice sweet spot of your gait, but you know that there's something coming up. Like you know you're about, you're, say you're cantering and you know that at, you know, at A, you're going to have to do a walk transition. All right, so we need we need something that helps let the horse know, hey, get ready. You're going to have to change that canter a bit in order to get to the walk transition. All right, so or you're going um, across the diagonal in a beautiful lengthening, and now you've got to come back and ride a corner at the end of the diagonal. You're going to need to like do a little something to let them know. Or you're just doing your collected trot, and then up ahead is your eight meter circle, you want to, it's not going to be like surprise turn, <laughs> right? You want to be like, Hey, here comes a circle. Are you ready? Now we go. So one of the main purposes of a half halt is to prepare the horse. So to prepare the horse for things that are going to require a slightly higher degree of engagement than their, um, where they are. Right. So it's sort of a nice thing. It's like, Hey, get ready. <laughs> get ready for this. This here comes the good thing or the thing that's going to require a little bit more. And I, th I think the canter to walk transition is a really good example because, um, even if your horse is like awesome and perfect, they're still going to need this little bit of extra something to bring the canter almost to the speed of a walk and then to be able to lightly step down to it. So it's something to take something that's good and, um, create a higher degree of readiness for something that requires it. So that's one purpose. The other purpose is if you're going along and you have your nice sweet spot of your working gates or your collected gates and something starts to fall apart, keyword starts, you can instantaneously or instantly like apply a half halt, a set secret code for a set of aids that rebalances the horse and to bring them back to where they started. So it's to nip a problem in the bud, right? So it's a rebalancing. I was good. I started to lose something. I apply this rebalancing maneuver 
and now I'm back to where I started. If you wait too long, <laughs> if you wait too long and like now the horse is like running, his head's in the air, he's swinging his rear end around, like that's not going to take a, a, that's not a half halt. That's, you know, we got to like regroup, <laughs> start over, do, do some other stuff. Right. So I always think of a half halt as a very particular in, in that sense, the way it's often described, it's a very particular thing. It's a refined thing and it takes um, something that's working good and helps it prepare for something that's going to have a little raised requirement of engagement and balance, or it's to um, very quickly return, um, return to balance if you started to, um, started to fall apart. So the biggest problem I see is that the half halt is used in unrefined circumstances. It's used for beginner dressage people to like, um, to try to achieve that. Oh, I'll use the dressage term on the bit, you know, cause that's what people hear. Get them on the bit, half halt, half halt, half halt, <laughs> drive with your leg, hold with your hand, wiggle the bit back and forth until they get round. Like, mm, no. Um, don't half halt in that. That's where what I teach and finding the sweet spot. It's like, we've got to look at each individual horse in this moment. Everybody's coming from a different place. You know, every horse is different. Some are really energetic with dropped backs, but low necks. Some are energetic, but their back is up and their neck is high. Some are, you know, some are crooked this way. Some are crooked that way. Some are different combinations. So that's why I really emphasize empowering students to be able to take their horse from wherever they're starting and try to achieve a state of uh, the horse carrying their pole high. So self-carriage, pole high, and then a stretchable top line. So balanced that the horse's top line can let loose and be stretchable. So that's your working gates. That's, you know, pole high, carrying yourself, stretchable aligned, aligned enough that your horse can release those top line muscles and be swinging through his back, even in a more uphill posture. So stretching, stretch a bull, but not necessarily always stretching. Sometimes they're carrying themselves up. And so if you can find that now, maybe we can start to have a more universal half halt. But here's the thing the way to find that sweet spot is so individual. You know, every horse is different. So a certain combination of relaxation, energy, and balance. And when you go through that process of finding the sweet spot in order to arrive at those quote unquote working gates, chances are if your horse is going to fall apart for a moment, you're going to need to do a little bit more of that sweet spot medicine to get back. And often I don't know what that is, like if I'm teaching. But as we go through the process, the student discovers that just right combination of relaxation, energy, and balance. And so when I'm teaching them, I'll say something like rebalance, or are you in the sweet spot still? And they'll be able to realize, you know, oops, nope, I'm not in the sweet spot. And then they, you know, I'll say, here's, here's some brilliant teaching. I'll say, do something. <laughs> but that's in the context of I've already empowered them to search and to experiment and to quickly play with the possibilities. And they've learned what their horse needs and they've learned to listen to their horse. So even if we're doing working gates and even if we're working on a dressage test, if the horse starts to lose balance, I'll say to them, Oh, rebalance, do something. And they'll do whatever the magic is between them and their horse to regain the balance. For one, it might be energizing them. For one, it might be whew, taking a little breath and just flowing with them. With another, it might be playing with the shoulder position a little bit. For another, it might be playing with the hindquarter, you know, to the right or the left. I don't know, but they do. And the same thing when I'm riding. I'm thinking of how did I get in the sweet spot and I'm constantly monitoring it. So if I start to lose balance, I'm not thinking, well, the book said I got to put both legs on, hold my back and close my hand. <laughs> no, I'm thinking, you know, what have I been feeling from this horse? 
And what do I need to do to make an adjustment to get back there? So now let's say we are in the sweet spot of our working gates. Let's say things are going really well. And then we do have that circle coming up or that transition coming up. This is the moment where half halts can start to become a little more universal. And so what you'll notice is horses after a certain degree of education and a certain degree of skill, they'll all start to look a little the same in the same way that like prima ballerinas all kind of look the same after a while, right? Because human posture is human posture is human posture. Horse posture is horse posture is horse posture. They're, they have start to have more qualities in common. They're all at a more similar starting point. They're aligned. They're loose through their backs. They're pole high. They're carrying themselves. So from that universal place, we can start to have more of a universal language and say, like if I say, hey, rebalance your horse. So let's say I've got 10 students and they're all riding them alongside and then they're going to make a walk transition. You know, they're cantering down the long side, they're going to make a walk transition. If I take those 10 students who are all in a sweet spot for their um, collected canter and they, they're able to have their home base collected canter and then they do a thing to prepare for the walk. They rebalance their horses to prepare for the walk, and then they walk successfully. If I were to ask them, hey, what did you do? It would start to sound more and more the same. There would be, out of the 10 people, there would probably be, um, they would probably all have very similar things that they asked their horse to do. They probably all said something like, yeah, I sat up to bring the horse's weight back, but I paid attention that he's kept active and in the rhythm. Um, and I just, you know, directed the energy uphill, making sure to check my self carriage. Like it would start to sound more and more the same because they're all starting from this really nice, successful starting place. But even then there will be some variety because one of the people's horses might be lower energy. So that person might say, well, first of all, I made sure that I was activating the hind leg before I sat up. And another person who had a really active horse might be like, well, first I sat up, but I kept really paying attention to make sure that I didn't stop my seat or that they didn't stop their hind legs or something like that. And another person might not have to think about the energy at all. It's just always there. So the end result the purpose is the same. Prepare my horse to be more balanced to be able to do the transition. Prepare so he's more balanced and more ready. So the purpose is the same. The what's happening by looking at it will be also the same. Each horse should get taller, carry more weight behind while maintaining the energy and have a more a taller, shorter look to them, to the shape of their stride before they walk. So they'll all, the result will be the same. The aid still will be slightly different, but they'll be, they'll be more similar at this point. But I did read some articles where they showed a horse, like a young horse, and it was like really crooked and his head was like twisting up in the air and very crooked and clearly like impulsive and going faster than the rider wanted. And the article was saying, you know, with a horse like this, you're going to need to apply lots of half halts. And I'm thinking, no, <laughs> no, don't get on that horse and just start squeezing and bracing and holding. That horse needs to find a sweet spot. That horse and rider need to find a place where he's comfortable transportation and he finds a place where he feels the alignment inside his body and he can maintain that let loose aligned posture and have them feel like, whoa, mom, thank you so much. I feel great. Right. That horse doesn't need all the aids shoved on, on him at once. And I know this probably really experienced artful riders who could do it, who could just put that package together. 
but I'm just not sure if that's what we want to do. <laughs> Sometimes taking a little more time to get the basics so the horse is participating along with you pays off a lot in the end. Okay, so let's suppose you study dressage naturally, you've got your sweet spot, good for you, now do you get to add all those aids? No, not necessarily, because there's still a missing, there's another missing piece that I haven't even really talked about yet. I've mentioned it, but not really talked about. And that's the idea of the the purpose. So the if the purpose of the half halt is to rebalance the horse and create this state of preparedness. We have to think not just about the body being prepared, but what about the mind being prepared? So there's in normal descriptions of a half halt, there's usually not a lot of mental participation. Now, when you train, if you always apply this set of aids right before you do something hard, they can start to get the picture. They're like, oh, I get it. <laughs> Something's probably going to happen here. You know, horses are very, very smart. But instead of saying, let me move your physical body so that your mind figures out that something might happen, like what if we use that state of preparedness from a mental standpoint? Like what if there's a way for your horse to know mentally, oh, something's going to happen. And because I know something's going to happen, I'll start to organize my own body. It's always easier to change a horse's body when the horse wants to change his body. So remember, we're, we're talking about posture and everything affects posture. Everything. So let's, let's address everything. Like, let's make sure that we're, we're working with the horse on a mental, emotional, and physical level. And so let me, let me give a little bit of an example of an exercise. And it's related a little bit to, uh, if you listen to the episode about the grid. So the grid is an example of where you can, you can play with this idea too, because you're doing these intersections and sometimes you turn this way and sometimes you turn that way and your horse has to kind of be ready. So it's, it's going to be similar to that, but I can start building in this um, a mental and emotional preparedness right from the beginning, from very, very early on. In fact, I start this sort of thing online. So I have a state that I'm in that's neutral, which means carry on until further notice, <laughs> right? And then there's times when I'm asking for something, you know, there's a change, there's some, something changed, you know, I'm walking, now I'm trotting, but there's this really important step in between those two, which is a state of readiness. And when I'm playing with horses, if you watch my videos, often I say this out loud, out loud, ready. <laughs> and this ready moment is to help them mentally get into a state of preparedness. So I'm not telling them what they need to do with their body. I'm just giving them a little like heads up. <laughs> And so even if, you, if you're just sitting there in your chair, you know, and just say it, say the word ready, like with, with excitement, like ready, like be the cartoon of ready. And I'll bet you, I'm willing to bet that if you guys are really experimenting with this and you really did say it out loud, you sat up a little taller in that moment. Like it's really hard to say ready and slump at the same time. <laughs> ready? Like it's, it's almost impossible, like, but say ready and kind of like embody being ready for something, you know, embody it. And so, you know, you could also think, here, here's a little example. Imagine if we're all sitting in a room together and we've been talking for a long time and you're comfy and I, and I tell you like, Hey, just so you know, sometime during when I'm talking, I'm going to do a little thing where I count to three and then after I count to three, whoever jumps out of their chair, the fastest is going to get a million dollars, but you're not allowed to jump out of the chair before I say three. And don't worry, I'll let you know when it's coming. 
You'll, you'll know when it's coming. I'm not going to surprise you. So you go on with a lecture and you're listening, you're sitting there and maybe you're starting to stretch out and you put your legs out in front of you. Maybe you're crossing your ankles and you're a little slumped. And then at some point I go, okay, we're going to do that thing where whoever jumps out of their chair when I count to three gets a million dollars. Okay, ready? (laughs) And when I say that, like, imagine if that was really true, what did you probably do? If your legs were stretched out in front of you with your ankles crossed, you probably brought them, you bent your knees and you got your feet under the chair. You probably scooted forward. You're probably sitting up on your seat bones a little bit more, not back on your tailbone. You're probably starting to feel a little stretched up and toned in your muscles, but still relax. Remember, because you lose it if you jump out too soon and you're in this like ready and waiting and you're excited because like a million dollars is pretty cool. So you just half halted yourself. <laughs> when, when people ask me like, what, how do I ride a half halt? I give them that example. I'm like, get ready, come to attention. And what, what you do, you get taller, you tone yourself for a minute, right? And then you wait, right? So it's, there's that self carriage to it. You don't keep tightening your muscles. You just like become toned and engaged and then you wait and your antennas are out and your eyes are open and you're listening because you want to hear when I go one, two, three, and then you can go. So if you get the mental part and they're really ready and willing and waiting, they're going to bring their bodies. They're going to do with their bodies what they need. They know they need to do. And you're going to get 80% there with their help. And then, yeah, there's some considerations, you know, when you're doing your collected canter and you're preparing to turn down center line, do your counter changes hand at the half pass, you might want a very refined particular half halt. But imagine if they're coming around and they're like, I'm getting ready, I'm getting ready, and then you can refine it. So an example of how to get that started. So picture like really baby, baby horse, super baby horse. And you're just at the point where you're starting to go around the whole arena. And one of the thing exercises, my favorite go-to exercise is just follow the rail and then halt in the corners. And this is all with no reins. So I'm trotting down the long side. I'm embodying, confirming, and allowing them to trot down the long side. 100% totally with them. They know, just keep going. You're doing great till further notice but my plan is to halt in the corner. So do I just keep riding the same and let them slam into the corner? No. When I get an appropriate distance away from the corner, I'm going to shift from just following the trot to coming to attention. And I might literally say out loud, ready? And I'm thinking, ready? It's going to be halt now. And then I apply the aid. So get ready is just get ready. They don't know what for. It's going to be a halt is where I start to just give a little hint. And then now is now. And then if they don't stop, I can use the wall to help me stop. And I'll repeat that until they start helping me. I repeat it until when I start to go ready, they go, oh, I'll bet you we're going to halt. And then we halt. And then now that's how I know I'm done. Because they start to prepare when I start to prepare. So now they know how to prepare for the halt that's in that corner. So let's say we progress with that and it's another day. And then I'm going to go down the long side of the trot and then I'm going to do a canter to part in the corner. So that day I'm going to trot along, embodying, confirming, allowing, active neutral. When I get an appropriate distance away from where I want to ask for the canter, I'm going to go ready. This is the same ready, exactly the same ready. It just means, hey, something's going to change. It's going to be canner. So now I start feeling that hips. I give them a little hint, like, look, feel that. It's my right hip starting to come a little forward. It's going to be the right lead now. And then now is now. And I might repeat that until when I say ready, it's going to be, they go, oh, 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 I know it's going to be the canner. (laughs) Yes. Yes. You give them a chance to go, oh, I think I know the answer. And then you're done. 
Now, if you keep doing it the same way, they're just going to start assuming. And every time you get ready, you do whatever that thing was. But that's why you need to change it up. So now, let's say it's another day of the week. And I'm trotting down the long side. And I go get ready. And my horse is like, oh, is it a halt or is it a canter? Yes. Thank you for asking. Now I've got the half halt. Now I've got the half halt. And I might stop in that moment and go, oh my gosh, I felt you getting ready. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Like they realize when I get ready, it means we're going to do something and they need to be ready and waiting and really looking at me so they have a hint. And if you, if your horse tends to have a preference, so let's say that they have a much stronger preference for cantering instead of stopping, you can go down there and go, Active neutral the trot, come to ready. And if the horse goes, oh, I know, shut up, we're cantering. (laughs) Then you go, actually, we're going to stop. So ready, we're going to. And if your horse tries to just take over and make an assumption, you do the opposite one. And it's not to trick your horse or punish your horse. It's just a game. It's a game to see if you can find that ready and waiting. So if I play that game well, then I'm going to trot down the long side. I'm going to get ready. They pick themselves up. They stay active enough to be able to canter, yet having their weight back enough to be ready to stop. And in that moment, they're asking me a question and then I can pick. And I go, thank you so much because that is, that is the whole thing of dressage, that state of readiness. And that's why at Grand Prix, they don't like do all the trot work and then all the canter work. They switch it around a little bit. As the levels go up, you start to switch around because your upper level dressage is not only testing the movements, they're testing the state of preparedness. Otherwise, they'd give you five circles before your one tempies (laughs) to prepare. The whole point is that you can recover. You can recover, you can get ready, and your horse stays in this state of mentally and emotionally and physically prepared. So play with that exercise of how do you achieve that state of that in-between. And so that's the that's the mental emotional half halt. It's playing with their minds and just notice that the way a horse prepares for something, anything starts to resemble having their weight back, being active enough and ready to wait. So that's why I love playing with um, a transition forward versus a halt. Are you ready to canter and you're ready to stop? If you can be ready for both of those things, or if you're walking, can you be ready to back up or can you be ready to trot? And somewhere in the middle is the state of preparedness. And so sometimes a half halt for a horse, a set of aids that rebalances, is simply going around asking yourself the question, could I stop? (laughs) Could I back up? Could I canter depart? And if you've practiced asking yourself that question, then you know what that feeling is. And then, then your half halt slash rebalancing aids is whatever you do to make yourself now feel more ready. And it can change moment to moment. And yes, as you advance and your horse is more in balance and more refined, those aids will start to be, um, to start to feel like what you read in the book. So the only people who can read those descriptions in the book and be like, yeah, are the ones who already know how to do it. (laughs) People trying to learn half halts don't read the stuff in the books, but play with your horse so that the mental emotional part is there and they can help you out to get to that place where a a refined half halt could work, that's where you need to experiment. You need to find the sweet spot. You need to be able to talk to your horse about relaxation, energy, and balance. So a half halt is a mental, emotional, and physical state of preparedness where the horse is ready and waiting for what's coming up next. And how you achieve that depends on what the horse is already supplying But in general, it's a state of activity, engagement, self-carriage, keenness, and patience rolled into one. To just focus on applying aids to change the body without taking into account the mental state of readiness is to make your and your horse's job harder. 
So I hope that helps. I hope it brought a little bit of clarity. <laughs> I hope it brought some, I hope it minimized some confusion. And, and mostly I hope it gives you another way of playing um, with this idea of rebalancing your horse to take into account the mental emotional state. When we have our horses working with us and playing with us, and we are better at explaining and motivating, they take care of their bodies and they will get you at least 80% there. And then, yeah, we can talk to their bodies too, and we can refine it as we go along. So anyway, I hope that helps. Uh, as always, let me know. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck.